Thank you so much. Well, good evening, everybody. Monday, Thursday is always such a poignant occasion, isn't it? Uh, it's so full of pathos. Jesus intentionally going to the cross, stealing himself for the torture that was to come his way. And how do we follow him? How do we take up our cross and follow him this Easter? I remember the morning clearly. The phone went before six in the morning and uh, dear friends of ours, uh, he was my colleague in ministry, their three-year-old son was dying of a brain tumour and they were in accident emergency and the little boy was in terrible pain and they wanted me to go and pray and so by about just after 6 a.m i was in worthing hospital and mum and dad would take it in turns to comfort their son and then go and cry in the corner and i was praying god where are you and then I got another call as I came out of that room for a minute and there was a lady who was part of the congregation who was, as it turned out, a few days from death and she was upstairs in intensive care. And I went up and I prayed with her. And then I came down and I went back into the room with little Josh. And then I needed to make a phone call to Brighton Hospital because Alan had had multiple heart attacks the day before and was having major heart surgery that morning. And I wanted to pray with him before he went down to the surgeon. And then I went back to the room with Josh where at last the sedatives were beginning to work. And then I needed to ring my grandmother because she was very unwell, 150 miles away, and I was wanting to get to the hospital to see her. And as it turned out, as I pleaded for each one of their lives, um, I took three of their funerals within the next month. And that morning, I didn't fancy going into the office. And I went and I sat on the beach and I watched the waves come in. You see, there are times when the Jesus you want is not the Jesus you get. Have you ever had that experience? What do you do when the Jesus you get is not the Jesus you want? That's all part of what's going on that first Easter. As we've learned this week, it was never as simple as saying the Jews wanted a Messiah to overthrow the Romans. As we've been seeing all week, the last thing the wealthy and influential Jewish leaders was what wanted was another uprising. It would undermine their delicate balancing status quo that they were doing and were prof profiting from very well. But it seems that the peasant class the people who followed Jesus did expect and did want that kind of Messiah who would overthrow the Romans. And Jesus that Easter desperately disappointed them. The Jesus they had was not the Jesus they wanted. Their experience was about to fall through their theology of who a Messiah would be and what a Messiah would do. And at some point, if you're a follower of Jesus, we have to come to terms with the idea that the Jesus who is, is not always the Jesus we want. The real Jesus doesn't fit in with our plans or accommodate our ideas about what's best, and he insists on us surrendering to his will. Have you ever had that experience when you've prayed and the Jesus you get is not the Jesus you want? The breathtaking and profound thing about Jesus is he leads by example in this. At Easter, 
Jesus didn't get the father he wanted. It's at Easter that Jesus says to his father, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but yours be done. That's exactly what is going on in the Garden of Gethsemane. As Jesus wrestles with the father he wants and the father that is, and he sets us an example. But hey, that's to run ahead of the story this evening. So let's recap where we've gone so far uh, this week as we've tried to see again in the scriptures new light into this Easter story. We've been following Mark's um, day-by-day account of various events in the life of Jesus in Passion Week. And tonight we come to Gethsemane. There are a number of options. We could have talked about that beautiful story of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. We could have talked about the upper room. We could have done John's discourse, which is such an extensive prayer set on that night. Uh, But we're going to, we could have done the first communion service, but we're actually going to look at Gethsemane that first Monday, Thursday. So just to recap, if we go to the next slide, please. So on Monday night, we looked at Jesus cleansing the temple. Then on Tuesday night, we looked at Jesus being very rude to the Pharisees. On Wednesday night, we looked at Mary anointing Jesus with oil. And tonight, we look into the story. If we go to the next slide. We go look into the story, into the depths and the mystery of what happened in that Gethsemane. For those of you who are joining us tonight and haven't been part of this week, this is a sculpture of Jesus Christ, which is nearly three meters tall, but the point is it's 17 meters down under the ocean, and you don't see Jesus until you go down into the depths. And there's something very symbolic about that this Easter. We have to travel into the depths of what was happening to see him afresh. And that's what we're going to try and do tonight as we look at the story of the Garden of Gethsemane. Let's read it together. Let's go to the next slide. So Mark 14 says this. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them. Stay here and keep watch. Going a little further, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, Daddy, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Next slide, please. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And once more he went away and prayed the same thing. And when he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They didn't know what to say to him. And Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise. Let us go. Here comes my betrayer. How do we follow Jesus this Easter to the cross? You only have to live long enough to suffer. The Bible clear is, a, is clear about that. In this world, you will suffer. It's all part of living in a broken, messed up world that has ignored the maker's instructions. And being a Christian doesn't give you an exemption certificate from all of that. The only choice we have is not if we suffer or not, but how we suffer. How we respond to what happens to us. Between the events that happen, over which we have little or no control, and our response to those events, we have the chance to choose our attitude. The Christian American preacher Charles Swindle uh, puts it this way. The longer I live, 
the more I realize the impact of attitude on our lives. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It's more important than the past, than education, than money, than circumstances, than failures and the successes, than what other people think or say or do. It is more important than appearance, giftedness or skill. It will make or break a company, a home, a church. And the remarkable thing is we have a choice every day regarding the attitude we will embrace for that day. We cannot change our past. We cannot change the fact that people will act in a certain way. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing we can do is play on the one string we have, and that's our attitude. He says, I'm convinced that life is 10% of what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. When it comes to suffering, people have typically two responses, two attitudes to their suffering. The first group are basically resentful. When some people suffer, it generates anger. This is not how life should be. This is not what I signed up for. This should not be happening to me. Now, this reaction does have some advantages. Generally, it means that people come out fighting. With a cancer dose diagnosis, for example, they place a great emphasis on remaining positive. And you'll hear phrases like, I hate cancer. I'm going to fight this. And their resentful energy is channeled into leaving no stone unturned in searching for a cure. And so it does have positive aspects to it, but it's not always positive. I visited a lady once whose husband had died, and she said she was so sad that she would curse every time she saw the sun shining. She was so consumed with anger that this would have happened to her. And you see, the thing is, when some people suffer, they grow bitter and angry. And it's not just with the events, it spreads around their personality. It becomes something that's projected onto everyone and everything, including God. And sadly, what happens is that their response to suffering, their attitude only serves to deepen their suffering and the suffering of the people they love the most around them. Their sense of how unfair life is actually deepens their darkness. So the first response to suffering, our attitude that we see in so many people, is one of resentment. The second one is that people grow resigned. The second group of people have a di very different reaction. They become fatalistic. They become resigned. Often they just give up, but generally they're just submissive. What will be, will be. This kind of suffering is positively encouraged in some religions. Islamics, for example, is rooted in the idea of submission of all life events to the will of Allah. And once again, this response to suffering of resignation has some strengths and has some weaknesses. At its best, people are humble. Why shouldn't, why shouldn't this happen to me? They are more patient and forgiving of medical staff, for example but it also has enormous weaknesses. In India, the suffering of the lower caste Hindus is embraced with an utter hopelessness and despair. This is our lot. It can lead to a disempowered loss of dignity and choice and no hope of change. All of us have a tendency to lean one way or the other on this when it comes to suffering, when it comes to experiencing the Jesus we don't want. It's either resignation or resentment. Now here's the thing. Resentment is rooted in something true. God did not plan things this way from the beginning. All suffering is wrong and a result of sin. And resignation is partly true. God is in control and can be trusted but how do we hold those two things together at the same time? What is Christianity's response to suffering? And it's Gethsemane that teaches us that. 
Let me be clear, this is not asking the question, why do we suffer? But this is the qu answering the question, how do we suffer? How do we respond when the Jesus we have is not the Jesus we want, when he doesn't answer our prayers? How do we follow Jesus to the cross of suffering? Remember, Jesus is about to be arrested, tried in a show trial, brutally beaten, flogged, and then crucified. He knows what awaits him, and he cannot sleep. His life on earth is reaching this terrifying climax, and now he must make his final preparations for what is about to come. What does Jesus' attitude teach us about how we respond to suffering? Two things to notice in passing. Notice this, first of all. Jesus shared his struggle. How does Mark know what Jesus prayed in those intimate moments of aloneness when not only he wasn't there, but those who were supposed to be there were also asleep? How do they know? The only answer is that Jesus must have subsequently decided to tell the disciples about that lonely night of prayer. The only option we've got is that some point after his resurrection, Jesus decided to share with them the brutal realities of that Gethsemane night. Why did he choose to do that? We're not told. But I'm of the opinion he did it so deliberately and intentionally for one very good reason. You see, Jesus knew that one day his disciples and generations of followers after them would also be facing terrible suffering in many forms. And on those long nights awaiting their fate or suffering their pain, it would be enormously helpful for them to know that not only had Jesus suffered, but he had experienced their fear and their anguish as well. Jesus deliberately chose to share with his disciples the trauma of that night. In passing, I wonder who of us have learned to share appropriate weakness. We've already seen this week, haven't we, that the obsession of religious people is to look good. And here is Jesus setting us the opposite example, just as he did when he shared with his disciples about his temptations in the desert. In his moments of temptation, in his moments of fear, in his moments of anxiety, in his moments of trauma, he chose to share with people subsequently just how hard it was. When I was a young follower of Jesus, there was a man that I looked up to. He was a wonderful man, really godly example. And he was so encouraging to me and he was generous to me and I went to him for advice but the thing was, he never once shared with me any hint of weakness. And what that did to me was, it always meant that I kept something of myself covered up. Because I didn't feel like I had permission to share my challenges, because he never did with me. Jesus was not like that. I remember as a young minister, I was, uh, I was called to meet Ken Costa. For those of you who don't know, he was the marketing brains behind Alpha. He was the church warden at Holy Trinity Bom Brompton. He was this hugely influential banker who basically was behind much of the influence that Holy Trinity Brompton has had over the years. And he asked to meet with me. And I, I went to meet with him in, in London. I waited in these swanky offices of this bank for a while. And I, I waited for about 10 minutes. And then this man came running out. And he said, follow me. So I just kind of followed him. And he, he, he was walking so fast I needed to jog. And he, he, we, we went to this restaurant. It looked a very posh restaurant. I was quite excited. I was thinking, this is going to be great. And he sat down. We have never met before. I heard, he has never spoken to me. He just looked me straight in the eye. I was just getting a menu, I was just settling down. He looked at me, he said, money, sex, or power? All Christian men fall one of three ways, which are you most prone to? <laughs> you notice how quiet it's gone in here now? 
I looked at him and took a big swallow and said, well, I feel pretty vulnerable to all three, actually. He said, great, we can do business. Should we order some food? And we started to talk. Who do you choose to share appropriate weakness with? Not just for your sake about being known, but to encourage others. Some of us are so concerned about being devout that we're not actually setting a living, dynamic example for people around us. Because unlike Jesus, we haven't learned to share our struggles. Those who have ears to hear, let them hear. The second thing, in passing, is just want you to notice just how horrendously lonely Monday, Thursday was for the Lord Jesus Christ. He's he's facing the trauma of his life with literally the history of the universe weighing on his shoulders. And he's looking for his disciples for some support and encouragement And Luke 22 tells us that as he had made all those arrangements for the upper room, a last intimate meal with his disciples, that's just gone straight over the head of the disciples. They're arguing about who is the greatest. Can you imagine the isolation that Jesus feels where he's looking to them for some kind of support and they're arguing about who's the greatest? This still thinking that Jesus is the Messiah that's going to defeat defeat the Romans. And then, of course, there's the betrayal of Jesus. And then, as it gets to the climax of the evening, he takes his trusted Peter, James, and John, and they go to the Garden of Gethsemane, and he has to do business with God, and they fall asleep. Not once, not twice, not three times. Can you imagine how lonely Jesus felt? The isolation of that moment. But um, the worst pain, the very worst isolation, is not them. It's this growing fracture in his relationship with his father. None of us know what it is to be in a perfect relationship of love. But many of us know the horrendous pain of grief and divorce. None of us can imagine what it must be like when Jesus is separated from his Father. We can only imagine what that silence and absence meant to a, meant to a relationship that has been eternal and perfect. It's only hours now before Jesus shouts in accusation, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But that heartbreaking fracture is already starting here. At Jesus' baptism, God had spoken from the heavens. um, uh, This is my son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. The same had happened at the Mount of Transfiguration. And in Gethsemane, he is utterly silent. The best that Jesus can do is fill the gap with his anguished prayers as taking on the sin of the world temporarily fractures the triune God himself. Jesus became alone so that we never need be. And here we return to the idea that the Jesus they, the, the, the Jesus we have is not the Jesus we want. That the disciples then, the Jesus they had was not the Jesus they wanted. The Jesus they wanted, a warrior king who would defeat the Romans, was exactly who Jesus refused to be as he chose instead to enter into Jerusalem on a donkey and frust, frustrate everybody with his peaceful intentions. And now in Gethsemane, the roles are reversed. The father Jesus had that night was not the father Jesus wanted. And now he has to do what he, exactly what he requires of us, his followers. And what is that exactly? How are we re- to respond to suffering? What we see with Jesus is neither resentment nor resignation. What we see in the Garden of Gethsemane 
is not someone who is angry and resentful at the injustice of us all, though this is the greatest injustice the world has ever seen, the Son of God crucified for the sins of the world. And nor do we see Jesus fatalistic and resigned, a victim just giving in to whatever comes his way. In Gethsemane, Jesus walks a third way, not a resentful way, not a resigned way, but a redemptive way. A redemptive response to suffering holds two things in to be true simultaneously and holds them in attention that only faith can sustain. The first truth is that God is all-powerful and promises to answer prayer. Jesus himself had taught his own disciples to pray, saying, anything you ask in my name will be given to you. So Jesus prays fervently, let this cup pass from me. He is pleading with his father to avoid the cross and the rejection and the loneliness he is to face. Because he knows his father can do it and he knows his father loves him and he is listening. So he pleads, he contends, he argues, he makes his case. He himself had taught his disciples the parable of the persistent widow who made such a a fuss that eventually her request was answered. So when he had poured it all out and exhausted his words and there was no response, he started again. He kept going, take this cup from me. He didn't stop asking. I'm reminded of the words of Walter Wink on prayer who said, biblical prayer is impertinent, persistent, shameless, indecorous. It is more like haggling in an outdoor bazaar than the polite monologue of the church. This is how Jesus prays that night. He prays as someone who really believes that his father has all the power and all the love to easily answer his request. That his father is his only hope and he's not going to settle with a simple no. The second truth that Jesus holds on to, by faith that night, equally tenaciously and in no way watering down the passion of his first conviction but balancing it out is this. My father is sovereignly in control of all events and always doing his redemptive work in every situation and I have to trust. I have to acknowledge that I see the now but he sees the forever. I've got the picture but he sees the video. And ultimately, I will subject my judgment to his. I will submit to his will. Ultimately, I am more committed to God's will than my own. We're going to be taking an offering later for the children's hospice. And um, I share with you this week that as a family, we have... um, had need of the children's hospice as we lost our granddaughter Elsie. And when I think about this this submission to the will of God, my go-to is my daughter, my lovely daughter, who at the funeral and the thanksgiving service of her daughter stood up the front and she simply said, I say this with grit, through gritted teeth today. But my lovely daughter is better off in my father's arms than he is mine, than she is in mine. Wow. This is the redemptive way to respond to suffering. We see it in Gethsemane. Not resigning, not resentful, but simultaneously pleading and submitting. Let this cup pass from me, but not my will but yours be done. Unfortunately, it's not always a faith tension that's held well in the Christian church. There are elements of the church which seem to be more resentful in their attitude to suffering than, and, than they are faithful. I see no evidence in the Bible that ill health is always the work of evil and can be banished by the prayer of faith. That first assumption that all sickness is the work of the devil seems almost to lack faith rather than to be evidence of it. 
On the other hand, huge swathes of the church are often as fatalistic and passive in practice as some other non-Christian faiths and fail to ever journey out of the shallows into the depths of this great gift of prayer to contend with God. To be a mature church, to follow Jesus to the cross this Easter, we have to learn to hold intention that Gethsemane prayer. A redemptive response to the suffering we encounter. To plead and contend. To say, Lord, take this from me. And a simultaneous submission. Not my will, but yours be done. Never allowing the two to conflate and to collapse one in, into the other, but holding the two in tension. And when we do, there comes the freedom that surrender and resolve brings an abandonment into the hands of God the other side of things as D.L. Moody said on his deathbed I see earth receding I see heaven descending this is my coronation day isn't that great? freedom simultaneously submitting and pleading so how do we do it? How do, we, how do we access this life tonight? How do we follow Jesus to his cross this Easter? Well, if you try and follow Jesus in this, you might as well try and be a dinosaur. Hard work and effort will only get us so far, it won't deliver the goods. The only way to live this way is to invite Jesus to fill us with his spirit his character, his attitudes, his outlook, his orientation, his will, to invite him to supernaturally replicate his life in our lives. He's available tonight for him to do just that, that we might follow him to the cross, not resentful, not resigned, but redeemed, simultaneously pleading and submitting. And why am I so confident about that? Well, the only reason God the Father refused to answer his son's prayer that night and his motivation to endure his own brokenheartedness was that we might all experience Jesus. For God so loved the world that he gave us his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. That's why God the Father said no. That's why heavens rang hollow that night. For God so loves us. Do not hesitate to believe for one moment that God will fill you with the spirit of his son if you ask him. Because it's the only reason he refused Jesus that night. Wow. Let's pray. So Jesus, my prayer for myself and for all my brothers and sisters here tonight is that you would let us see your footprints and in them place our own. Jesus, there are times when you're not the Jesus I want. You don't answer my prayers the way I want you to. And I'm struck with the mystery of all of that. But at the same time, this Maundy Thursday, I am in awe of you. Who did exactly the same with your father. You put your trust in him. Even though he wasn't the father you wanted at that moment. 
Lord, we're, we're in awe of your courage, your love. We're in awe of you. And so, Jesus, we pray that this evening you would come and fill us with your spirit, your life breathing, speaking, living within us so that we wouldn't be resigned about our suffering. We wouldn't be resentful about our suffering. But simultaneously pleading and submitting, we would learn to live this redemptive story and follow you to the cross of Easter. Come, Lord Jesus. We need you. And we are in awe of you.